Mr. Corum is present. We have three items on our agenda today, and I'd like to quickly address two of them, committee rules and subcommittees. Before focusing my remarks on Judge Garland's nomination to serve as the nation's next Attorney General. We'll be voting today to adopt the committee rules for the 117th Congress. We've made very few limited modifications on a bipartisan basis, and my hope is that we can adopt these rules by voice vote. We'll also be voting to formalize our subcommittees, including jurisdiction and membership, membership of each. We have two reconstituted subcommittees as Congress, the Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law, and the Subcommittee on Human Rights and the Law, which I previously chaired. I know that our subcommittee chairs are eager to hold important hearings on legislation and oversight. I look forward to a very active subcommittee schedule this year. I hope we'll be able to approve these subcommittees by voice votes as well. Now let me turn to the major business at hand, Judge Garland's nomination to be Attorney General. I don't think there's much to say about Judge Garland that hasn't already been said. He's a man of extraordinary qualifications. His life has been dedicated to public service and advancing values that are vital to the Justice Department's functioning. Integrity, independence, fidelity to the rule of law, and a commitment to equal justice for all. <clears throat> I know that a number of my Republican colleagues share my perspective and have announced publicly. Senator Tillis said in a press release, I have no doubt Judge Garland will serve with integrity, keeping the best interest of our country in mind. Senator Cornyn said the day after the judge appeared before us, and I quote, I was struck by Judge Garland's humility and humanity. I believe he's a good man and a good person for this job. I could not agree more than with what uh, Senator Cornyn said. And I do believe you were here in the second panel and heard the testimony of Mrs. Butler. She's a mother of two children whom Judge Garland personally mentors. Not to take anything away from any other witness, but that mother's insight into Merrick Garland was testimony one cannot ever forget. Our colleague, Corey Booker asked a final personal question during his first round, which allowed Judge Garland to speak to the heart, speak from his heart about life in public service and what this country means to him and why he would give up a lifetime appointment to the second highest court in the land to endure this political process and become attorney general. This is what Judge Garland said. I come from a family where my grandparents fled anti-Semitism and persecution. This country took us in and protected us, and I feel an obligation to the country to pay back, and this is the highest, best use of my own set of skills to pay back. It was an electric moment we won't forget. The nation needs this kind of selflessness in a nominee. America will be better with this kind of person leading the Justice Department. I am proud to be supporting Judge Garland. I hope all my colleagues will join me in doing the same. Now I turn to my friend, ranking member, Chuck Grassley, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> it's quite obvious we're here today to vote on the nomination of Judge Garland to be Attorney General. I intend to support his nomination, but I want to state my concerns about the direction of the Department of Justice in hopes that the judge will work with us to do what we, he said that he wants to do pretty simply keep the Justice Department non-political and, and non-partisan and apolitical. Judge Garland, as I said in his hearing, is an honorable man. He says he wants to follow the law, nothing more and nothing less. I believe that is what he said he wants to do. His career of faithful public service, I think, means I owe him a chance to just do exactly what he said, but he has his work cut out for him. During the campaign, President Biden said that his administration would be the most progressive in history. I'm afraid that might be right. It'll be up to Judge Garland to stand up to efforts to turn the Justice Department into an arm of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party as happened under President Obama. So I will back this up with some statistics and things coming before the judge as Attorney General. 
First, the Durham investigation. We covered the investigation a lot at Judge Garland's hearing and in written questions. While Judge Garland has consistently said that he has no preconceived notions on Durham, he has unfortunately refused to give the same commitment on Durham that Barr gave on the Mueller investigations. In written questions as well, he has refused to explain what standard exactly he would apply to evaluate Durham and failed to give the kinds of easy commitment that Barr gave to this committee. What he has told us, though, is that in spite of these failures to commit, he expects that he will allow Durham to proceed. I take Judge Garland at his word that he will, in fact, allow Durham to proceed. I will also put him on notice this way. Because of his repeated failures to commit to protect Durham, any actions taken to end, cover up, or otherwise undermine the Durham investigation should be interpreted as premeditated and political. If Durham is sidelined, that will be the only explanation for Judge Garland's consistent refusal to answer like Barr did on Mueller. As I said, I believe Judge Garland is an honorable man, so I expect that he will, um, that will not happen, but his credibility is on the line. Second, on religious liberty, Judge Garland spoke movingly of his family seeking refuge in the United States while fleeing anti-Semitism. Like Judge Starr told our committee at the hearing, I trust that he understands the importance of religious liberty. By voting for Judge Garland, I'm expressing confidence in his willingness to take those rights seriously. I asked him many written questions about religious liberty and was satisfied that a Justice Department run by Attorney General Garland will protect religious liberty as the broad first freedom envisioned by our founders and not marginalize it as a backwards lifestyle preference as envisioned by a lot of progressive radicals. On the subject of the right to bear arms, I'll be frank. Judge Garland's answers on the right to bear arms have not been encouraging. During his hearing, he said he'd faithfully enact President Biden's gun-grabbing agenda. I hope he will stand up for the independence of the Justice Department and follow the law when President Biden instructs him to violate the Second Amendment. If he doesn't, I expect the courts will have something to say about that issue. On the subject of litigation positions, if Judge Garland really wants to show us that he's the next Ed Levy and not the next Eric Holder, he should pay close attention to positions the Justice Department takes on litigation. Just because the Trump Justice Department took a position doesn't mean that that position was wrong. If every four or eight years, the Justice Department comes up with a new list of statutes it won't defend or rights it disfavors, what's the point then in passing laws? I hope that Judge Garland, thinking back on his long judicial experience, will preserve the institutional credibility of the Justice Department. It's a similar issue with prosecutorial discretion. Just because a prosecutor has discretion in how to charge and how to try a case doesn't mean the Attorney General has discretion in how to charge and try all cases in ways that change the law. We saw this with DACA under Obama. I'm concerned we'll see this in the death penalty and the illegal entry under Biden. The role of the president is to take care that the laws be followed. 
And of course, this applies to the Attorney General. The Attorney General doesn't get to use principles of discretion to change the law, however, might, however much he or she might want to do that. Then on the subject of slice funds, I think I brought this up in some discussions, either privately or publicly, with the Attorney General nominee. When the Justice Department enters into a settlement with a bad actor, the money should go to the victims and the U.S. Treasury. Given that money to third parties, especially those Congress has defunded, is a direct assault on the appropriations process. I frankly can't see any good reason why the Justice Department would rescind the existing regulations on this subject. Any effort to change these settlements will be pure and open political favoritism. I could go on. There's a sue and settle issue, government by blog post with guidance documents, abusive consent decrees, defending IRS targeting, Operation Choke Point. Democrats have collective amnesia on the scandal a day at the Obama Justice Department during which it was almost always punishing Obama's political enemies. What do all these practices have in common? The practices I just listed, besides being partisan and political, they're an effort to do an end run around the Congress. If Judge Garland is serious about having a nonpartisan Justice Department, and I think he is, then he will nip these bad practices in the bud. He will enforce the law. He will not manipulate the powers of the executive to make the law more satisfying to progressive activists. Judge Garland, if he's serious about what he told us, has a big job ahead of him. He will be under tremendous pressure from within the administration. And particularly from pressure from congressional Democrats to turn the Justice Department into Mark Elias and the ACLU and do it with each of them having guns. It'll be up to him to keep the Justice Department from turning into, a, from turning into the social Justice Department. I take him at his word that this is not what he wants and that his occasional ev evasions were in good faith. I plan to vote for him. I hope that my trust is not misplaced. Heal. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Um, at this point, I'd like to announce that any member that would like to submit a written statement in relation to this nomination may do so. And those who wish to make oral statements in the committee, I will stay as long as necessary for that purpose. But the press, uh, the chairman notes the presence of a quorum, and I believe at this point we can call the roll on both Merrick Garland and the two procedural issues related to committee rules and uh, subcommittees, and then leave it open for questions, uh, pardon me, statements by members. So on the nomination of Merrick Brian Garland to be United States Attorney General, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Leahy. Aye. Aye. Mr. Graham. Aye, by proxy. Aye, by proxy. Mr. Cornyn. Aye. Mr. Lee. No. Mr. Cruz. No. Mr. Sass. No, by proxy. Mr. Hawley. No. Mr. Cotton. No, by proxy. No, by proxy. Mr. Tillis. Aye. Mrs. Blackburn. No, by proxy. Chair Durbin. Aye. Both the yeas are 15, the nays are 7. 15. 15. 
On that roll call, as announced, the nomination will be favorably reported to the floor. I understand we have an agreement to voice vote both the committee rules and the subcommittee memberships and jurisdictions. On the committee rules, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. And on the subcommittee memberships and jurisdictions, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. And with that, I turn to Senator Leahy. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I am very pleased the committee has advanced the nomination of Judge Merrick Garland to serve as our next Attorney General. I've known him for years. He's extremely well qualified. I know that five years ago he was the right person for the job to which he was nominated at that time, to become a member of the U.S. Supreme Court. In fact, a number of uh, members of this committee serving at that time, including a former chairman of this committee on the Republican side, had earlier said he'd be perfect for the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. But unfortunately, they all changed their mind. And uh, the committee failed to do its job. They did not consider his nomination. And for the sake of our nation's security and commitment to the rule of law, I'm glad we chose a different path this time. Judge Garland's going to take the helm of the Justice Department at a pivotal time in its 151-year history. I've worked with the Justice Department through eight prior administrations. This will be the ninth. The plain fact is I've never seen the flagrant, relentless politicization and abuse of the department as we've witnessed during the past four years, not at any time under either Republicans or Democrats. This committee knows that to be true. So Judge Garland's job is not just to restore the independence and integrity of the Justice Department, but to restore our faith in the American justice system itself. Now, that'd be an incredibly tall task for any incoming Attorney General. But Judge Garland will also be charged with confronting the clear and present danger of domestic white supremacist extremism the ideology that fueled the deadly January 6th insurrection against our democracy. And we can all remember being rushed off the Senate floor when that happened. Thankfully, Judge Garland has decades of experience confronting this threat as a Justice Department prosecutor. He, after all, led the department's prosecution of the Oklahoma City bombing case in Unabomber Ted Kaczynski. No one better understands the nature of this existential threat than Judge Garland. And nobody better understands what we must do about it. Judge Garland's unshakable commitment to serving his country is deeply rooted in who he is. He's the grandson of Jewish refugees. They fled anti-Semitic persecution in Russia. He fundamentally grasped that America's greatness rests on our bedrock principles of justice and the rule of law. Judge Garland understand just what it means to be an American and how our system of justice is a hallmark of our identity. I've known Judge Garland for a long time. I've met his wonderful family. This is the nomination we need, the time we need it. And I was proud to vote for him. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I applaud you and the others who brought this to a head. Thank you, Senator Leahy. On the Republican side, uh, does anyone seek recognition? Mr. Chairman. I'm going to go in order if, sure. if Senator Cornyn seeks recognition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. I agree that Judge Garland has the temperament and the qualifications for the job of Attorney General. As I said, I was impressed by his humility and his humanity, and I intend to support his nomination, but I must express some concerns because I hope we're not headed toward another Obama Holder Justice Department take two. Judge Garland seemed to say, and I agree, that the DOJ should stand apart from partisan politics and political influence, and that the Attorney General needs to have the strength and courage to stand up to political pressure. 
One of the things that was of particular concern to me was that Judge Garland would not commit to continuing the Durham probe. I remember the controversy over the Mueller appointment as special counsel and how much people insisted that he be allowed to do his job, and I agreed with that. I cannot imagine a world in which a different standard would apply to Mr. Durham, and that's what I will expect. As we've seen over various oversight hearings involving Operation Crossfire Hurricane, the Department of Justice and the FBI played fast and loose with their investigative charge. The Horowitz report in particular revealed gross abuses of power, including the electronic eavesdropping of an American citizen and the use of defensive briefings to advance an investigation. And I must note, while defensive briefings are routine, as Attorney General Lynch said, I would note that there is no evidence that the Trump, Trump team was provided any defensive briefing that would have warned him about the efforts by the Russians uh, to infiltrate his campaign. I'll also note that Judge Garland didn't really answer anything in his QFR responses that would give us any confidence that he will ensure that the Justice Department does not return to the Holder days. I find it particularly troubling that during the hearing and in response to his questions, to questions he advocated for both Vanita Gupta and Christian Clark, both of whom he barely knows. One need not look very far back into their respective records to find evidence that they are all about politics in the Justice Department. Calls to defund the police as recently as June of last year. Calls to eliminate qualified immunity for law enforcement. All of these should be non-starters for anyone assuming a position in law enforcement. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not sure. I hope that the Department of Justice under Judge Garland will use the words of Justice Jackson as his lodestar when deciding what policies to implement. Justice Jackson said the qualities of a good prosecutor are as elusive and as impossible to define as those which mark a gentleman, and those who need to be told would not understand it anyway. A sensitiveness to fair play and sportsmanship is perhaps the best protection against the abuse of power. And the citizen's safety lies in the prosecutor who tempers zeal with human kindness, who seeks truth, not victims, who serves the law and not factional purposes, and who approaches his task with humility. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Feinstein. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm really very pleased uh, to see this day come and see that Merrick Garland is going to get what I really consider his just due. I have regretted what, what's happened in the past as I've watched it happen. And I really truly believe this is a fine man that's going to provide a very special uh, career route to things that will make us all very proud. So I just wanted to say that. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to see this vote. Um, hopefully, it means a new day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Senator Feinstein. Senator Lee? Pass. Senator Cruz? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When President Biden nominated Merrick Garland, I was originally uh, gratified. There were a great many choices President Biden could have made from individuals who have long records as partisan warriors. And Merrick Garland is not one of them. Uh, Judge Garland has spent over two decades on the Federal Court of Appeals. Uh, he's built a reputation for integrity. Uh, he has built, built a reputation for not being overly partisan. And so I was hopeful that when Judge Garland came before this committee, that he would indicate a commitment to the rule of law and a commitment to standing up to the hard politicization and weaponization of the Justice Department that we saw during the eight years of the Obama-Biden administration. I have to say 
Judge Garland's testimony before this committee and his subsequent answers to the questions for the record left me deeply, deeply disappointed. On question after question after question, Judge Garland refused to answer virtually anything. When asked by multiple senators about the Durham investigation, he refused to answer whether he would fire John Durham. He refused to answer whether he would meet the bar standard. He simply said he didn't know anything about the Durham investigation. Now, of course, when Bill Barr had been nominated to be Attorney General, he didn't know anything about the Mueller investigation either, other than he knew that it was an investigation into the President of the United States in a highly politicized context. And knowing that, Bill Barr made a commitment to this committee that he would not fire Bob Mueller absent good cause. There's nothing to prevent Judge Garland from making the same commitment except if he wanted to have the flexibility to fire him, Mr. Durham, for something other than good cause. And yet repeatedly, over and over and over again, he wouldn't answer that question. He also refused to answer the question whether the Department of Justice will continue prosecuting people who cross the border illegally. Never mind that the Constitution obliges the president and all of the executive branch to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, Judge Garland wouldn't tell this committee that he would faithfully execute the laws. He refused to answer whether the repeated violent assaults on the federal courthouse in Portland, including multiple violent attacks on federal law enforcement officers, constituted terrorism. Indeed, to the extent he proffered an answer. He suggested that it did not because those attacks occurred at night, something that I am confident is a novel definition of terrorism, since I am not aware of any legal definition in statute or otherwise that defines terrorism as activity that only occurs when the sun is in the sky rather than at nighttime. He refused to answer to this committee whether or not the Department of Justice would urge that the Heller decision be overturned. The Heller decision, of course, is the landmark decision upholding the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. He refused to answer that question. He refused to answer whether he would reinstate Operation Choke Point, which abused federal regulatory authority to target politically disfavored individuals and companies. Subsequent to his hearing, I and many other senators submitted a series of questions for the record for Judge Garland. I didn't think it was possible for answers to be less forthcoming in writing than they were in person, and yet the answers to the QFRs are indeed less forthcoming. In response to a whole series of questions about the Durham investigation, his response was, as I testified at the hearing, I do not know anything about the Durham investigation except what I've read in the press. His response, when asked about the meeting on January 5th, 2017, in the Oval Office, where President Obama and Vice President Biden directed the Department of Justice and the FBI to target the incoming Trump administration and to target the incoming national security advisor, Michael Flynn, a meeting that is discussed at length in the Horowitz report, the executive summary, which Judge Garland said he has read. His response was, I do not know the facts of the situation you described as I stated at the hearing. As a nominee, I should not comment about Justice Department officials prior decisions or hypothetical situations. Mr. Chairman, I want you to pause to think about the two things he says he won't comment about. Anything a prior Department of Justice has done, he won't comment on that, and he won't comment on hypothetical situations. I'm not sure what remains if you won't comment about actual situations or hypothetical situations. What remains is essentially a null set. 
He refused to tell this committee whether he would reinstate the politicized decision-making of the Eric Holder and Loretta Lynch Departments of Justice, and he refused to entertain any hypotheticals whatsoever. When asked about Operation Choke Point, he said he wasn't familiar with it. Questions for the record asked, now that he's had an opportunity to familiarize himself with it, what are his views? His answers were, since the confirmation hearing, I have not studied these issues any further and have no additional comments. On the question of the Second Amendment and whether the Department of Justice would seek to overturn the Heller decision and effectively erase the Second Amendment from the Bill of Rights, what little commentary Judge Garland would provide in his written answers only raises cause for concern. He said in particular, I believe as a general matter that we should be very careful that people who are entitled to guns get the background check that allows them to have them, and that for those who are not entitled and who, are concern who, who we are concerned about because they are threats, because they are felons, or for whatever reason are barred by the law, that there is an opportunity to determine that they are not permitted to have a gun. He makes no commitment to protect the Second Amendment. On the question of whether the Department of Justice would enforce immigration laws, and in particular continue to prosecute those across the border illegally, here's Judge Garland's answer. As I said to Senator Hawley, I just haven't thought about that question. The President has made clear that we're a country of borders and with concern about no national security. I don't know of a proposal to decriminalize, but still make it unlawful to enter. Since the hearing, I've had not had time to think further about the question. So since the hearing, Judge Garland has not had time to think further about enforcing our immigration laws. This pattern is reminiscent of Sergeant Schultz out of Hogan's Heroes. What Judge Garland has told this committee is, I see nothing, I hear nothing, I know nothing. At times when convenient, his answers to the QFRs resort to the judicial canons of ethics to say, as a sitting judge, he is prohibited from commenting on any particular issue. But I would note at the hearing, he was quite willing to comment about prosecutorial priorities when asked by Democratic senators to make commitments in that regard. Not only did he refuse to answer questions at the hearing, not only did he refuse to answer questions for the record, but Judge Garland is also one of the few Biden cabinet nominees refusing to take in-person meetings with senators, categorically refusing to take them. Multiple other Biden nominees are taking them. And so I would note to my colleagues on this committee, both sides of the aisle expressed considerable frustration with the Department of Justice that resists efforts of the Senate to engage in oversight. Judge Garland's conduct before this committee and his confirmation gives no reason for comfort in that regard. If he's not willing to answer questions now before he's confirmed, the likelihood of his being willing to answer questions after he was confirmed is only smaller. On the response to the questions for the record, it is difficult for a lawyer to draft answers to this committee that are more of a jump in the lake to the Judiciary Committee than these answers are. They reflect a view that saying, I don't know, on any policy issue is acceptable to be confirmed as Attorney General. I very much hope that my initial assessment of Judge Garland proves right. From the vote on this committee, it appears likely that his nomination will move forward and that he will be confirmed. But for the Republican colleagues who have expressed concerns about another Holder or another Lynch Department of Justice, I would note that both Eric Holder and Loretta Lynch were much more forthcoming before this committee than Judge Garland. He has not even met the standard, the Holder or Lynch standard. And for this committee, the precedent this committee is set, setting is that a nominee for attorney general can sit before this committee and essentially refuse to answer all questions. 
Say, I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you. I don't know. And whichever party is in the majority will vote to confirm that nominee nonetheless. That's a precedent I predict will come back to haunt this committee. And I hope that the votes to confirm him will not prove a mistake. Thank you, Senator. Uh, for the record, Republican members of the committee submitted nearly 850 questions to Merrick Garland after our hearing and the oral questions which were submitted at that time. The senator from uh, Texas, a junior senator, uh, in 38 pages of questions asked 127 questions, uh, which was his right to do. Uh, Merrick Garland responded, if not to your satisfaction, did respond to all the questions. In terms of his meeting with you, it was my understanding that he offered a Zoom meeting in light of the pandemic situation, but you said that you'd feel more comfortable with a person-to-person -person meeting, and I don't know if that ever occurred. But I would say that he did make an offer to meet with you through Zoom, which unfortunately has become a pretty common part of our lives in public service in light of the pandemic. Senator Whitehouse? For uh, what it's worth, Chairman, the... Uh Zoom was good enough for our meeting with, between myself and uh, the Attorney General nominee. I just want to respond to a thread that is developing in these comments and that I suspect will continue to be developed. Um, there's considerable reporting now about Republicans trying to reinvent January 6th, that it wasn't so bad actually um, it was really Antifa that did it. It wasn't really Trump supporters. It wasn't an insurrection. It wasn't an effort to block the vote count. And I think we're going to see more and more um, of that. And it's basically a simple insistence that repetition can defeat truth. Um, sort of gaslighting at industrial scale. And um, I happen to actually like and admire Eric Holder quite a lot. Um, the context of Eric's time at the Department of Justice was that under the previous administration, things had gotten so out of hand that the Attorney General had to resign. The Attorney General of the United States had to resign. There were torture memos that were so bad they were withdrawn by that Justice Department. There were warrantless wiretapping memos that were so bad that the department leadership said it would quit if it wasn't fixed. This is all within a Republican administration. There was the U.S. attorney political firing scandal and then a political shutdown of that investigation by Attorney General Mukasey. The White House contacts rule was abandoned so that willy-nilly people in the White House in political roles like Karl Rove could chat about matters with the Department of Justice. Thankfully, Attorney General Holder rebuilt that rule, and I believe it's been relatively honored, and I know that Merrick Garland will honor it. Um, Eric was the first ever African-American attorney general for the first ever African-American president. And there was an enormous diet of what I would consider to be whipped up faux scandals that mostly got traction in right-wing media, not in any kind of serious disciplinary or other review. He had to undertake a massive cleanup to put the department back in order after the Bush-Gonzalez years. And in my view, I actually think that they uh, dodged some tough calls that I would have liked to have seen. I would have liked to have seen them look at why false statements made by 501c4s shouldn't be investigated, at least apparently false statements. I'd like to see them explain why the tobacco case, which the department won, isn't a model for a civil investigation by the Department of Justice into the fossil fuel climate denial fraud. So 
this effort to cast the Obama holder years as some sink of political abuse is really turning the facts on their head. It is gaslighting and it's wrong. If you want to know how things went under the Trump Department of Justice, let's just say that they refused to investigate or prosecute a president. Just refused to because of an OLC opinion that has never been vetted by an Article III court. Read the brief filed by retired judge, retired United States District Judge Gleason on behalf of sitting United States District Judge Sullivan. And you will find out basically all you need to know about the political mischief of the Trump Department of Justice. So let's not reverse history here. Let's tell the truth. Senator Lee. I'm actually just really disappointed. I, I uh, wanted to vote for Judge Garland. I was looking forward to doing so. I expected to vote for Judge Garland. I had even suggested Judge Garland's name uh, when the vacancy occurred uh, in the last administration in the FBI director slot. No idea whether he would have taken it. Didn't happen. I've got great, great respect for him. Uh, he's, a, he's a hero. I mean, he's, he's, he was a longtime prosecutor. He put away some very bad people as a prosecutor. He's got a distinguished career over almost a quarter century on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. I've had um, a handful of interactions with him over the years, some in social settings, others uh, in a professional setting. I, I've always been really impressed with him. He's a, a genuine, decent person um, and someone who, um, who I think I would enjoy working with in any capacity. And so it was with that mindset that I came into these hearings I was uh, very disappointed that in response to a number of my questions in the first round, I didn't get uh, answers. And it's not that I wasn't getting the answer that I wanted, it's that I wasn't getting a substantive answer at all in response to a substantive question. I understand the need uh, uh, for candidates for judicial office to invoke the judicial canons. I, I understand the need for a sitting judge in other circumstances to avoid <clears throat> answering policy questions in public or legal hypotheticals. We were informed uh, at the outset of, of this hearing with Judge Garland that, um, that he would engage with us on this uh, and that the judicial canons wouldn't stop him from uh, talking about the, the office for which he's been nominated now. So I had hoped and, and expected that we would get more by way of substantive dialogue and engagement than we did. When that didn't happen in the first round, I, I thought maybe it'll go better in the second round. I asked him a separate set of questions in our second round at the hearing and still uh, got a number of non-answers. Um, I would note here that um, look, in, in many interpersonal interactions, when people interact as friends or in a social setting, even as, uh, as people interact in this body with each other, members of the public, not everybody feels the need to answer every question directly every time. But in some settings, you expect some answer. For example, um, I spent a good part of my, uh, my professional career before I became a senator 10 years ago um, as a litigator, as a lawyer appearing regularly before um, uh, federal courts of appeals whether in a federal court of appeals or any other court, I always knew, I always understood. I'd been trained uh, from a young age when you're asked a question by a judge or a panel of judges, uh, as, as normally happens on appeal, you do have to answer the question, even if it's not the question you want to answer. And if it's a hypothetical, you've got to engage in a meaningful way with the hypothetical. You've got to provide an answer 
and, and, it, and it's, it can't just be the answer that you wanted to get. You're also taught as a lawyer that when you go into a courtroom and if you try to skirt that rule, there will be consequences. You're probably not going to get the relief that you want. Depending on the judge, uh, you could potentially even be sanctioned. Uh, you're also not likely to be able to sit down when it's your turn to make an argument until you've actually answered the question. They just don't let that happen. <clears throat> judge Garland is, is familiar with this rule. He's presided over and participated in many, many thousands of cases and, and uh, many thousands of oral arguments. If someone in his courtroom just declined to answer uh, the question asked, whether as a hypothetical or otherwise, or instead answered the question that he wished uh, had been asked. I don't think Judge Garland and his colleagues would put up with that. I think there would be consequences to the attorney. They wouldn't be pleasant. More importantly, they wouldn't even be able to sit down um, uh, until they had answered the question. Now, that's why this was disappointing. Still, I wanted to vote for him, and I signaled publicly and privately that I hoped and expected to be able to vote for him. I just needed answers to a couple of questions. They didn't even have to be answers that I wholeheartedly agreed with, but there needed to be some sort of meaningful engagement on them. So I gave him additional chances, genuinely hoping that I'd get answers in the questions for the record. Now, I asked more than usual, uh, in part uh, because of this feature. I wanted to give him a chance. What I got was even less forthcoming than what we got in the in-person hearing. Well, the reason I say all of this is that I really do like him. I'm certain he's going to be confirmed. Look forward to working with him and getting to know him better. This was an unforced error. It didn't have to be this way. I wish he could have gotten my vote. I think I strongly suspect there are people advising him who are telling him not to answer. I don't think that's a, a good precedent or a good policy for us to set that with someone nominated to be the Attorney General of the United States that it's not important to engage in a meaningful way on questions that we asked, <clears throat> that we've asked, legitimate questions uh, that need answers. One of the areas where he did provide some substantive answer <clears throat> provided a sharp contrast to the areas where I didn't get an answer. When I asked him questions uh, in person in the hearing and then repeated those same questions in my questions for the, uh, for the record, again, um, hoping that I'd get more of an answer in writing that I got in person. I had several questions about statements and or policy positions taken by a couple of high-level Department of Justice nominees uh, from President Biden that I found troubling. I wasn't looking for any particular answer, other, although I had hoped that it might be something along the lines of, if that's what so-and-so said, I don't agree with that statement. Didn't get that. And in some instances, what I got in response to it was, Along the lines of, I know so-and-so, her views are perfectly aligned with my views. And that was the only answer I got. Had the statements and positions in question not been particularly troubling, particularly troubling especially considering the context of the nomination and the position, the two positions in question, I might have considered that less of a material issue. It doesn't have to be this way, and I hope that other nominees from this administration, particularly high-level nominees to serve in the Department of Justice, will take our questions seriously. Unlike a court, we in this committee aren't inclined to sanction people. I don't even think we're equipped to do that. It would be a bad idea if we equipped ourselves with the ability to do that. We're not a court. We don't hold people in contempt uh, for coming here and not, not answering uh, in the same way that a court might. It doesn't mean it's meaningless. It doesn't mean they don't have to provide any answer or expend any effort to try to address the substance of what's behind the question. I think we owe our committee that, and um, I think our constituents expect more. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to first address uh, Senator Lee, my friend's remarks, and I just had a different impression. As uh, the chairman has pointed out, um, the nominee answered many hundreds of questions, and he answered many, many questions here, and I just didn't see that. And as I sat here listening, I kept thinking about some of President Trump's nominees and how they didn't answer questions, and I didn't see my colleagues using that uh, as, as a defining reason for not supporting them. But I will leave that aside, and I have a respect for Senator Lee, and I hope that I appreciated that he saw some good in the nominee, and I'm hoping that um, he will work with him, especially in the area of antitrust, as we move forward. Secondly, um, I wanted to address some of the comments um, that Senator Cruz has, and I just want to make clear I thought it was very important that uh, the attorney, the future attorney general, address the issues raised by um, the, my Republican colleagues about the nominees that will be before us, uh, Vanita Gupta and Lisa Monaco and Ms. Clark. Um, and he said he couldn't do this without them, that they are his team. And of course, you're not going to agree with everything they've ever said. And he maybe doesn't agree with everything they've ever said. But the point is, he wants a good team in place. And in his words, um, he said this. He said, he has the humility to recognize that no one person can have all of the skills necessary to run the Justice Department. Um, and so in his words, they have experiences that he does not have to help him lead the Justice Department. And I think we will learn more about those experiences that they've had and the work that they have done and the support they actually have garnered um, from people from both sides of the aisle, um, including police groups, as we move forward. Third, I think it's really important to recognize here, uh, based on what the country has been through, the broad support that Merrick Garland brings to this job. More than 150 former Justice Department officials of both parties, including two former Republican attorneys general, Michael McKenzie and um, Alberto Gonzalez, who both served as attorney generals in the George W. Bush administration, have given Merrick Garland their support. And over 60 former federal judges appointed by presidents of both parties have urged the Senate to confirm him. The nation's largest law enforcement organizations, including the Fraternal Order of Police, the Major Chiefs Association, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, have expressed their support for Judge Garland's nomination. nomination. The International Association of Chiefs of Police stated that Judge Garland's years of experience, his expertise, and unwavering dedication to the rule of law are evidence of his outstanding qualifications. And 58 civil and human rights organizations, including the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and NAACP, commended Judge Garland's demonstrated commitment to equality, fairness, and access to justice. I think the department cries out for someone right now that has that kind of broad support, um, that has that independence that comes uh, from being a judge. Um, and for me personally, as I listened to my colleague talk about uh, the questions um, that he felt needed to be answered, I got a lot of answers from who respects the judge, who has supported the judge, the fact that the ranking member, Senator Grassley, on this committee, who's not an easy get um, is supporting this nominee. The fact that uh, Senator Cornyn is supporting this nominee, the fact that Senator Tillis is supporting uh, this nominee, I think that should mean something to my colleagues on the Republican side. Um, for me, the fact that this nominee committed to vigorously, vigorously enforce the law and prosecuted cases down the line, including um, against those uh, that tried to destroy this very building, this very capital, that meant a lot to me. The fact that he also showed compassion and the fact that he believes that um, as a prosecutor, you are in fact a minister of justice and his support for conviction integrity unions, his support for drug courts, something that we have shared in work on uh, with people on the other side of the aisle. In fact, Senator Lee and I and Senator Durbin and many others, uh, Senator Booker, uh, worked on changes to our sentencing because of that belief 
that in fact prosecutors should be ministers of justice. I asked the nominee about the many challenges facing our country, including criminal justice reform, with George Floyd's murder in Minnesota and many other cases across the country. He was committed and agreed that racial justice must be a centerpiece of the department's work. We discussed at length uh, the need to pass and reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act, which includes two um, very important bills. One, a bill I have with uh, Senator Cornyn, the Abby Hunold Act, about law enforcement response to sexual assault cases, and also my bill to protect victims of domestic violence and stalking uh, from gun violence that's included in that bill. I'm confident he will prioritize the Violence Against Women Act, something very important to the President of the United States based on all the work he has done. As chair of the Subcommittee on Competition Policy, Antitrust, and Consumer Rights, I was pleased to hear Judge Garland say that his first love in law school was antitrust. Not many people can say that. Uh, but he has a clear understanding of this really complex area of law, not only from his work uh, in law school and his work teaching, but also the cases that he has handled as a judge. He committed to vigorously enforce antitrust law and the principle of antitrust law is the charter of American economic liberty. And I think there is some agreement from both sides of the aisle that robust competition is essential to our free market economy and critical to ensuring that people get the best prices and choices. Vigilant antitrust enforcement means more innovation for the benefit of American families. He recognizes, the nominee, that these are not Republican or Democratic issues, that spanning back in our history, back to the Founding Fathers and to uh, Teddy Roosevelt and to um, Senator Sherman, uh, that there was heavy-duty Republican interest in these issues, as there is on the Democratic side. Finally, I would note what both Senator Durbin and Senator Leahy discussed, and that is uh, his profound understanding of how to go after cases of white supremacists and extremism. The horrific attack on our Capitol on January 6 made very clear that we need leadership at the Justice Department that is uh, equipped to respond to not only what happened that day, but to work to make sure it doesn't happen again. That means, of course, prosecuting these cases and getting to the bottom of who funded this and what happened in this case. But it also means taking this on as a priority going forward. This is the nominee uh, that is going to do this. Judge Garland has the integrity and the independence that we need in the Justice Department. I think people have had enough of political involvement in everything from pardons uh, to decisions in cases. Um, and it has affected the morale of the people that work in the Justice Department. And most importantly, it has affected the morale of the American people and how they feel about our justice system. We have before us someone who's in a unique, unique position to bring back that integrity, to bring back the rule of law. And I wholeheartedly support Merrick Garland for Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Senator. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate your patience in listening to all of us. And in deference to your time, uh, I'm going to try to be brief and submit a statement for the record. Uh, I wanted to be here for this vote personally and to make a few remarks, because I think this day is a very good one for democracy. Uh, Judge Garland is not only a brilliant lawyer, and a widely respected jurist. He's a decent man and a person of consummate character. And today, more than at any time in the Department of Justice history, character counts. There's a saying that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Judge Garland first went to work in the Department of Justice in the post-Watergate era, one of the low points in the history of this great institution. I met him in those days when I, too, was in the Department of Justice as United States Attorney for Connecticut. And he was beginning a 
very illustrious career. We were there at a time when the Department of Justice faced serious questions about its commitment to the rule of law. An attorney general of the United States had been convicted of serious crimes and a president all but impeached. And Judge Garland is now set to return at a moment when the department faces a similar moment of reckoning. He is the man for this moment because he embodies those qualities of commitment to the rule of law and to the independence and integrity of the Department of Justice that rise above any particular case or prosecution, any issue of law or fact. Some of my colleagues have expressed dissatisfaction with his refusal or inability to answer questions to them. Judge Garland owes answers to the American people. And those answers will be forthcoming in his actions as Attorney General. Actions speak louder than words. And one of the reasons why I so deeply respect Judge Garland's declining to answer some of those very specific questions about individual cases that would be inappropriate for him to answer at this point is that he said he wanted to talk to the career prosecutors, the professionals, the investigators, the lawyers doing the cases before he formed an opinion. His commitment to the professional excellence and integrity of those thousands of men and women who come to work every day seeking justice and public safety for the American people is of incalculable value. He knows those professionals, maybe not individually, but he was one of them, as was I. And as to the FBI and the ATF and all of the agencies that have acronyms, some known and others invisible to the American people, he knows those investigators and prosecutors are really the ones who do the work. And he wants to know their views. He wants to know the facts before he makes judgment. His commitment to the rule of law is especially important at this point in the Department of Justice's history because he will be a lawyer for the American people, not for the president and not for any special interest. He comes to this position with a wealth of experience in combating violent extremism. The FBI tells us that white supremacy and violent extremism are the biggest internal threat to our nation today. He is committed to combating hate crimes. That is, he said, quote, tear at the fabric of our society. And we know that hate crimes are spreading most prominently against Asian Americans today. And he is committed to counter it. He's committed to preventing gun violence closing the loopholes that could have averted Sandy Hook and Parkland and other tragedies and supporting common sense measures like emergency risk protection orders, universal background checks, and safe storage laws. He's committed to holding police accountable for misconduct and civil rights violations and beginning the very important work of sweeping systematic injustice, racial injustice, from our criminal justice system. At a moment like this, when character counts, I believe that Judge Garland will perform with excellence. He is the right person for this job. He's the right person for this moment. And only the 
reluctance of my colleagues to accept the fact he can't answer at this point all of their questions is the reason they may vote against him. That's not a good reason, and I think they recognize it. Let me just finish with uh, two points. First of all, uh, I am hoping that others who are part of the Department of Justice team, nominees who are awaiting a hearing and confirmation from this committee will be met with fairness and a fidelity to the truth that has been lacking in some of the criticism of them. I want to submit for the record an editorial that appeared in the February 28th Washington Post regarding the nominations of Vanita Gupta and Kristen Clark, that editorial finishes with this observation, quote, in another era, we might have opted not to dignify these attacks with a rebuttal. But in a time when elected officials have been known to embrace lies and conspiracy theories, it is worth stating sooner rather than later. Both these nominees have serious distinguished track records as champions of civil rights. For their opponents, that is the real rub." End quote. We live in a time when conspiracy theorists are trying to blame Antifa for the insurrection that attacked the Capitol and tried to stop the vote counting incited by Donald Trump. Those conspiracy theories, the falsehoods about Antifa, have been thoroughly debunked and denied by the FBI. And adherence to the truth is important when we're dealing with the rule of law and the Department of Justice, especially its top leadership. And I hope that my colleagues will demonstrate that sense of fairness and fidelity to truth, not the falsehoods of conspiracy theorists as we go forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. I want to thank all the members of the committee. And at this time, the Judiciary Committee will stand adjourned.